This morning, uh, we, well, as you know, we're, we're looking at sort of a bird's eye view of the book of Hebrews. We're trying to deal with everything that's in it. We may not get to every detail, although uh, the kind of character the Lord has given to me, I always try. Um, but uh, we're going to be looking at a significant chunk and trying to get you know, the, the full meaning of what's in this entire chapter at one time, realizing that I would say most likely when, when the author to the Hebrews wrote this letter to this audience, they probably just picked it up and read it publicly in one sitting. They got the whole thing at one time. So this is basically a sermon. It has uh, uh, one main point, and that is Jesus Christ is superior in every way to the Old Covenant. You can't abandon Him. You can't let go of Him. You can't go back to the old covenant shadows. You will perish with them because God's about to destroy them. You need to hold on to Christ. And the message, of course, is still applicable to us today. We need to hold on to Christ. We can't abandon Him and go into the world. If we do, we will perish. So anyway, the author to the Hebrews, on the basis of everything he showed us, all these examples of faith in, in uh, chapter 11 of those who believed God, and whose hearts were drawn out by His promises, and who left this world to seek after Him. On the basis of that, He gives us this exhortation. By the way, they did that no matter what the price, and we're going to see. There may be a price that we have to pay, but we, we must be willing to pay it. The author to the Hebrews writes, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance, and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him who has endured such hostility by sinners against Himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by Him. For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son, whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good so that we may share His holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. 
But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression yet once more denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may, we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. May God bless His Word to our hearing this evening, or this morning, excuse me. Now again, the author has reminded us again and again that our lives are really very short. In just a little while, he told us earlier, Jesus is going to come for us. And of course, while we're here, the Lord wants us to live by faith. By the way, you know, Jesus may not come in our lifetime, um, but He certainly will come for us at death, and life is short. So the Lord wants us to live in a particular way, and that way, I've already told you, is by seeking the kingdom of heaven with all that we have. He wants us to live by faith. He wants us to believe what He says in His Word. He wants us to trust Him. He wants us to follow Him. He's already told us if we don't have faith, it's not even going to be possible for us to please God because we have to believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. If we don't have faith, the author has warned us again and again, and even in this passage, that we will see God, but then we will see Him as a judge and not as a father. We have to have faith if we're going to please Him, if we're going to live the life He calls us to live, if we're going to trust in Jesus Christ and be saved, if we are finally going to enter into heaven. We saw last time, if we have faith we'll be able to answer those questions that everybody has in the world but don't know how to answer unless they know the Lord. And that is where we came from, God made us. Uh, where we're going, well, if we're Christians, we're going to heaven, we're trusting Him. And what it is that we are to do while we're here, which is set our faces toward heaven and go that direction until we arrive there. Now again, how can we do this practically. This is what the author to the Hebrews is really going to tell us in chapters 12 and 13. The first thing you need to do is to purpose to live the life with the same kind of effort that you would put into running a race. And of course, if you're going to run a race, if you're going to win, there are certain things that you have to do. You have to discipline yourself. You have to put certain things aside. With running, it may be food or various you know, things we do that just make us weak and we need to begin to discipline and train ourselves. Well, to run this race, the author says, there are things you, do, you need to lay aside as well. Those things would include whatever would encumber you and the sin which so easily binds you and tangles you up so that you can't run forward. Now, encumbrances are those things which are not necessarily sinful, but things that slow you down, things that weigh you down, things that distract you, things that weaken you and make it harder for you to do what God calls you to do. Remember Pilgrim's Progress, Vanity Fair, things lawful and unlawful. Uh, the things that were lawful can slow us down as well. If we love those things too much, we, will, we won't want to let go of them if the Lord calls us to let go or we'll spend too much time uh, doing those things or going that direction instead of pursuing what the Lord calls us to do. And of course, you know what sin is. Sin is doing the things God tells you not to do and not doing the things that He calls you to do. Every act of sin is something that is either offensive to God or harmful to your neighbor. He wants you to set 
that aside in order to run the race. You need to lay both of these things aside and live the life that God is calling you to live, a life that glorifies Him, a life that not only advances the kingdom of heaven in your life and makes you more like Christ, but moves His kingdom forward in this world because that is what He made us to do. And He says you are to run it with endurance. You are to live this life all the way to the end, all the way to the finish line, which is not until your life is over in this world. Now, the Lord has given to you a perfect example to follow, and that is the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, because He lived entirely for God's glory. He did not set His mind on the things of this world. He did not love the things of this world. He loved His Father's kingdom. He sought to advance that kingdom. His life was an act of continual devotion to Him. He came into this world in order to do a particular work the Father sent Him to do, and that was the work that was necessary to give you faith. He is the author of your faith. And in doing this, uh, the author to the Hebrews says, he looked forward to the glory which the Father had promised him, the glory which he would give him, the joy he had prepared for him, which was, of course, to receive that honor from the Father in heaven and to enjoy the company of those who would trust in him and would follow him to heaven, your company, if you are trusting him. He was willing to go through what was necessary to fight against his own natural inclinations to preserve his life. In the garden, he sweat blood as he was praying for the strength to go through the cross in which he would shed his blood in his striving, as it were, against sin. Now, it wasn't any personal sin on his part, but it was you know, resisting, of course, any temptation to that and also to complete the work necessary to eliminate your sin. He endured the pain and the shame of crucifixion. He went through all of that with his face set like flint toward heaven, and he received the rewards. He was crowned king over all. Now, again, as I said, he fixed his eyes on the goal, and he did not waver. And that is the example that he has left for you and for me. The Lord wants you to fix your eyes on his example, and he wants you to do exactly what Jesus Christ did to look forward to what it is that God has promised you. He has promised you joy in heaven. He has promised you love, that your heart would be filled and that you would be absolutely happy. He has promised you glory and reward. He wants you to look at what Jesus was willing to suffer for you so that you will not grow tired or disheartened in running that race that He calls you to live, if, even if the Lord should call you to suffer for Him as well in living the life that He calls you to live. So, He tells you, set aside certain things. Set aside the encumbrances, things that get in your way. Set aside your sin. Run the race with endurance, fixing your eyes upon Jesus Christ. Now, how far should you be willing to go in this race? Well, the author tells you in verse 4, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. Jesus sweat blood in the garden. Jesus shed His blood on the cross. That is how far He was willing to go. The author to the Hebrews says, you need to be willing to go as far as He did in your striving against sin in doing the will of God. Now, what sin is He actually talking about here? Well, He's talking about, to His audience, the sin of apostasy, you know, of leaving Christ to save their lives. He said, you should be willing to die. Hold on to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be worth it. It already is worth it if you truly know Him and love Him. You can't give Him up. But we do need to realize that the author's application goes beyond just the sin of apostasy. It really applies to every sin. You know, we should be willing, when you really stop and think about it, willing to die rather than to commit any sin. Now, why should we do that? Well, first of all, because you need to realize that's why Jesus died on the cross in the first place, was to take away sin. And as Christians, we say, we, we confess when, when we make public profession, we confess before others, we love Jesus Christ more than anybody else in the world. He is all the world to me, or whatever we might say. And yet, we do the things that He hates. And how can those two things be consistent? 
If we really love the Lord, then we should not want to sin. And we recognize that we do because we still have a love for sin, but let's let the love of the Lord override that to the point where we'd rather die than commit sin. That's how we ought to look at sin, though I would imagine we don't often look at it that way. Second, we should resist sin to the shedding of blood because God hates sin. Every sin to Him whose eyes are infinitely holy and He is infinitely pure is an infinite offense. Every sin, the Bible tells us, deserves His judgment and His wrath forever. Although in Christ, all those sins, thankfully, are forgiven. But again, if you love Him, then you would want to avoid like the plague everything that God hates. Paul tells us, really, in Romans 13, verse 14, that if we take this seriously, we should do this, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, become like Him in every way and make no room, make no provision for the flesh, for your sin with regard to its lusts. That's the kind of commitment the Lord desires. Now, another reason why we should resist it because if you don't resist sin, if you continue to practice sin, knowing that Jesus died for it and that God hates it, and what I mean by this is not that you continually fall into particular sins because we all have weaknesses, we all have struggles, and we, we, you know, we know that we have those from day to day, but if, if you just disregard what God says and you know that something is wrong and you continually do it and you don't care, well, that just proves that you really don't know Him. We've been warned again and again in, by the author to the Hebrews that, especially of the unpardonable sin, we're going to see one more example of that. But the Bible tells us that if we don't hate sin and we don't fight against every sin, it just shows that we really have never truly come to know Him. We really don't love Him. This is what John writes in 1 John 3, verses 4 through 6. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that He appeared to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. Now listen to this. No one who abides in Him sins. No one who sins has seen Him or knows Him. Now at first glance, this, this could shock all of us, and we, we'd all conclude that none of us really know Him because it says if you sin, you don't know Him. But what he means here is if you practice sin. There's certain tenses in the Greek like we have in English that talk about continuing action, and that's what's being referred to here. No one who abides in him continually sins. No one who continually sins has seen him or knows him. The sense is I keep going on in sin and I don't repent. Now, I think if we, if we get an idea of what this means, you know, Jesus died for sin, God hates sin, if I practice sin, it means that I really love sin and I don't really love God and I really don't know Him, we get a better idea of why the Puritans could write something like this in your bulletin, one of the quotes. Thomas Brooks writes, it's better to bear than to swear. In other words, bear whatever offenses and affronts than curse at somebody because, you know, they're offending you um, because that's sin. And it's better to die than to lie. I don't know how many of you have thought that recently, but rather than deceive, rather than tell lies, it would be better to die. And why is that? Well, because if you're a believer, you die and you go to heaven. That's a great blessing. If you lie, you're committing a moral evil that put Jesus on the cross that is offensive to God and something which, if you don't repent of, could destroy you. There's a big difference between those two things. The Lord tells us He wants us to hate sin and resist every single sin, to repent of all of them because they're hateful, they're offensive, they're harmful, they're not loving. The Lord wants us to love. But there's a fourth reason the author to the Hebrews tells us that you should be willing even to shed blood rather than sin. And that's because of God's faithfulness, interestingly enough, because of what He has promised to do for you if you don't repent of your sins, if you've really trusted Jesus Christ. Because God is a faithful Father, and He will make sure that you as His children will do the right thing. In other words, He will discipline you. Now, parents, I, I think you know that in order to get your children to do the right thing, you have to discipline them. 
And when you were children, growing up in your own household, you know that you had to be disciplined as well because by nature, children do things that are wrong. And they don't want to do the things that are right. They, they do just the opposite of what the Lord calls us to do. And so we have to discipline them to get them to go the right way. Now, thankfully, God loves you enough to do that very thing for you. He's made a promise to you in His Word that you will be like His Son. And He will make sure that you grow in that direction, in your thoughts, in your words, and in your actions. God will discipline you as a faithful father. Now, how is it that God actually does that? Well, there's a lot of ways. He does it through His Word. I don't know if, if any of what I've said this morning has stepped on any toes, you know, but whenever that happens, whenever you feel a conviction, whenever you see, wow, I, 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 my life isn't lining up to this, that is God's discipline. He's showing you. He's trying to convince you. He's convicting you. And that is a good thing because sin is a bad thing. So he works through his word to tell you what sin is. He tells you what it deserves. He commands you to repent of it. All of that is discipline. It's good. He works through your conscience by convicting you through his Holy Spirit. He even has those around you, whether they're parents or spouses or elders um, or you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, reprove you admonish you, correct you, instruct you. The Lord has given church discipline. Sometimes that's necessary to get someone to turn away from their sins. And as we know, the Lord also works more directly sometimes by intervening in our lives, bringing various hardships through relationships, maybe relational problems or financial difficulty or health issues. But one thing we should never forget is that when God disciplines you, it's because He loves you. He's not trying to be mean. I mean, parents don't let their children do things they know are going to hurt them because they love them. And the same thing is true of God. He disciplines you to get you to do the right thing because He loves you. Now, if He doesn't discipline you when you sin, that's when you need to be concerned because, as the author says in verse 8, but if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers then you are illegitimate children and not sons. If you can sin and get away with it, if God doesn't put His hand out to stop you, if He doesn't correct you, if you don't feel that conviction, if you don't see anything going on to turn you away, then you're, you're, you're not His is what the author to the Hebrews is saying. What you need to do is you need to repent and trust in Jesus Christ because if you do, the Lord will adopt you into His family and then He will treat you as a child and He will help you by His fatherly discipline stay on the narrow path that leads to heaven. That's the only path that leads to heaven, by the way. We have to walk in that path and the Lord will make sure that that's what we do. Now, what else should you do when the Lord disciplines you? Well, He says, first of all, don't take it too lightly. On the other hand, don't be crushed by it because it is a mark that you are His child, but rather, He says, repent. Repent of your sin. Repent of what it is He's putting His finger on, He's trying to correct. He's working in your life to do the right thing. Now, what if you don't repent? What if you keep on going, even though you see the signs the Lord is warning you and He's trying to turn you away? Well, the author says He's going to turn up the heat and He's going to make it more intense until you do. That's what he means here in verses 12 and 13. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. I would suggest to you that going from lame to having a limb that's twisted out of joint, that's worse. And what, what he's saying is that God will intensify it if you don't, you've got to let go of it. You've got to let go. You know how it is with disciplining children. You, you turn it up until they let go of that thing that's bad for them. God will do the same thing for us until we let go. And when we let go, then we'll be healed, you see. He loves you too much to let you go on doing the things He knows will destroy you. So what, what do you do? You repent. Now, what else can you do to fortify yourself against sin? Well, the author to the Hebrews really weaves two more things in here. 
something specific and something general. He says, pursue peace and holiness. It's interesting that he weaves peace in here. There must have been some issues going on in this body uh, that are maybe not uh, the most important thing, as it were, but he wants to make sure he gets it in there to remind them they need to be at peace, first of all, with those around them, because not to be is sin. Not to be is sin. God commands you to be at peace with everyone, with one another. That's why Jesus came into the world, to bring His kingdom of peace, to bring peace between us and God. That's what re being reconciled with God means. We're no longer at war, but now we're at peace. But also peace among everyone, particularly the members of the body of Christ. Third, because there, does, there needs to be peace between you and your brothers, because if there isn't, then you will quench the Spirit's work in your heart if you hate someone, if you're embittered against someone. And you're also going to be deprived of the additional strength that you might otherwise receive from fellowship with that brother or sister that you're at odds with. Fourthly, he says you need to pursue peace because unrighteous anger, if it's not dealt with in, in a godly way, will become bitterness. And when it becomes bitterness, it will affect everyone around you and will even help to turn other people against that person that you are angry with. We all know how that works. And it's sin. The Lord wants us to deal with it so it doesn't disturb the peace that He is trying to bring in His congregation. In other words, you're, you're fighting against the work of Christ when you are at odds with one another. So if you are at odds, especially with believers, if there's any friction, any animosity, whether you caused it or not, you need to do what you can to reconcile that situation. Jesus actually tells us that we shouldn't even seek to worship Him unless we've dealt with it first. If you're going to present your gift to the altar, at the altar, and again, Jesus is speaking in, again, the Old Covenant context as He comes ministering the gospel. Before you bring your gift at the altar and you remember your brother has something against you, go and be reconciled to your brother first and then come and offer your offering at the altar. The Lord doesn't want that to just lay because anger becomes bitterness and it corrupts it. It affects people around us. He wants us to deal with it and He wants us to preserve that unity, that unity of love and the bond of the Spirit. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the sons of God. So we are to pursue peace. Secondly, we are to pursue holiness in general. And this is something, again, both peace and holiness, which is absolutely essential to our arrival in heaven. Pursue peace, verse 14, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Peace and sanctification. Now, the author has already told you, you need to lay aside every sin, the sin that entangles you, that binds you, that imprisons you, because it's going to get in your way of living for Christ. Here again, he reminds you that if you're not doing this, if you're not laying aside your sins, if you're not fighting against them, if you're not pursuing holiness, if you're not seeking to become more like Jesus Christ, then you won't see heaven. And it's not because you're not doing enough work because your salvation isn't based upon works, but it's because you haven't trusted the Lord. Because if you did, you would be growing in sanctification. You would be pursuing that. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not those who couldn't care less about it, not those who aren't pursuing it. The Bible says there are certain things that are true about Christians, and one of them is they will pursue holiness. Now, I told you that he gives us another example of one who didn't do that and one who committed what may be another form of the unpardonable sin, and that is Esau. Remember, Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Remember, Esau was the firstborn. Esau had the right of the firstborn. The blessings were supposed to be passed on to him, which included being in the line of the Messiah. 
It included what God had planned with regard to the kingdom of heaven. Esau despised those blessings. He despised that right of the firstborn. He sold it for a bowl of soup, literally. In other words, he despised the blessing, and so he lost it. He missed out on the kingdom of God. The author is pointing to him again as an example of what will happen if you turn away from Christ, if you don't pursue the things of the Lord, if you don't run this race, if you don't fix your eyes on Christ, if you despise it instead, then you may commit the unpardonable sin. Remember, the author has been reminding us again and again when you have great privilege and you have great understanding and God has revealed so many things to you through His Word and by His Holy Spirit and yet you turn away from all of that. You can easily pass the point of no return. The unpardonable sin is, is basically blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, but there are sins unto death which apparently are other forms of this. You need to make sure you don't despise what you're hearing, that you don't turn away from it, that you don't keep, as it were, riding the line or on the border and not committing yourself to the Lord. You need to respond to what the Lord tells you to do. Otherwise, there is a point of no return where you may be shut out of the kingdom. Now, God is gracious, and He leaves the door open a long time. Praise His name for that, because a lot of us did resist for a long time. But there is a point at which you can sin against the Lord, and He may turn from you. You don't want to reach that point. If you haven't trusted the Lord, you want to trust in Him. Now, again, the author to the Hebrews is directing this toward those who really don't know Jesus Christ, even though they may be professing to know Him. This could not happen to a true believer. You know, we've seen that again and again. The Lord will preserve us. He, he will not let go of us. We will never perish. He will present us blameless before the Father. When we fall into sin, He will correct us. He will turn us around. He will not let go of us. But not everybody in the church is a believer. And this is directed against them. Don't turn away. Don't turn a deaf ear. Seek the Lord. Now, the author ends this chapter with just two encouragements, or with some encouragements and some warnings. And again, let's take this to heart. Why should we be willing to do this? To resist sin even to the point of shedding blood, to turn away from this world and pursue the kingdom of heaven. Why should we do what these in the old covenant did? Well, he gives us first an encouragement. The encouragement is the new covenant is so much more gracious than the old covenant. They were doing it under the shadows. They were doing it under the terms in which he describes the old covenant, which seemed to be more of a display of God's wrath than it was His grace, although we have to admit there was grace there. There was animal sacrifice. There was the priesthood. There was the possibility of cleansing, and that's gracious. But what else was there? Well, look at what the author to the Hebrews says. There was a mountain that couldn't be touched Upon pain of death, if anyone touches the mountain, they'll be stoned to death. Uh, there was a blazing fire on that mountain, a huge uh, roaring furnace, as it were, with black smoke that ascended to heaven. It was um, like a volcano, perhaps, or maybe even worse when it was erupting. There was the blast of a trumpet that was coming from the mountain and God's voice that was speaking. And apparently, it was, it was so loud and so terrifying, it shook the earth that not only the people, but Moses was terrified. And the people begged that God speak no more. And that's when the Lord actually instituted the office of the prophet. So that the prophet would take God's word and then bring it to the people instead of God speaking directly because it terrified them when he spoke. But this isn't the mountain that you've come to in the new covenant, is it? The author to the Hebrews writes in verses 22 through 24, but you have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who were enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Now, I like that picture better. Okay, I like that. It's different. You know, it's different and it's gracious. Newton writes about this in one of the hymns. He, Christ, has hushed the law's loud thunder. He has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. 
Now, did God do a bad thing when, when on the mountain he displayed his wrath and anger and his, his hatred of sin and his holiness? No. That was a good thing. And that was for our good. The Lord says that the fear of him is the beginning of wisdom. But still, I think we prefer the revelation of his grace, especially when we look at Sinai and realize that that's what we deserve. He gives us instead heaven. Now, that's what he holds out to you as an encouragement to you to pursue Christ because that is the kingdom that he has offered, and that's the one you'll arrive at. If you trust Jesus Christ, turn from your sins and, and run this race. But what if you don't do this? Well, here's the warning. Then you will see Sinai. You will see judgment. He says in verse 25, For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven? See, Jesus is coming again, the Bible teaches. And when He comes, He's going to shake not just the earth, like, he, like God's voice shook the earth in the days of Sinai, but He's going to shake the heavens and the earth. When He comes, He's going to destroy the old creation, and He's going to destroy those who refuse to repent and trust in Him along with it. And He's going to bring in a new creation which cannot be shaken. Another encouragement, by the way. But the encouragement is this. Don't be destroyed with the old creation. Turn away from your sins. Trust in Jesus who offers you the kingdom and will gladly give it to you if you just simply trust in Him. Receive that kingdom and then serve the Lord as He calls you to in fear and in awe. Pursue the Lord. Run that race. Be willing to run it even to the point that you would lay down your life for Him. Remembering, uh, again, that the God you serve is a consuming fire, and that is meant to drive us forward. And let's not only run that race ourselves, but let's make sure we do everything we can to encourage one another to run that same race and to get those who are in darkness to see that such a race exists and to get them to run it as well. Well, may the Lord help each one of us to do that. Let's um, bow in a moment of prayer and let's pray First of all, well, silently that the Lord will apply what we've heard uh, to us individually.